Uh, it certainly isn't, nor, nor uh, Janet, if we just focus, as we seem uh, preternaturally interested in our country in doing, on the Islamist terror networks. I think if we do that, we miss what really is the broader challenge, which is the uh, Islamist ideology's very uh, open plan, at least if you listen to the way they speak among themselves, um, to conquer our society, to overcome the West, um, by means other than terrorism, mostly by marching through our institutions. Hmm. All right, to the language, and then I want to go to the phones, Andy. We already have some people who have some questions and comments. So if we use the word Islamism, it underscores the fact that it's an ideology. Let me dig a little bit deeper here. Why do we refuse as a nation, for many in authority, let me put it that way, to recognize that this is, in fact, a religion. There's such a sidestepping of that point, and you talk about this at length and with eloquence, I'd like to point out in your new book, The Grand Jihad. Why do we try to ignore the fact that it is a religious worldview that promotes, in their eyes, a religious action? Well, I think there are two reasons for it, Janet, depending on uh, whether you're talking about the well-meaning people who do it and the not-so-well-meaning people who do it. The well-meaning people, I think, are afraid of a, a certain sort of tripwire. They think that if you acknowledge that um, Islamic ideology or Islamic scripture can't be divorced uh, from terrorism committed by Muslims and from the greater campaign uh, to change the, the United States, that you are inevitably uh, in a situation where you are basically declaring war against Islam. And, and that really is a box. That's a situation where we're allowing ourselves... Uh, to be put in a box by our enemies. I can't think of anything more absurd than the notion that if you simply um, acknowledge the facts of life uh, in terms of what is causing the uh, campaign against us, you somehow have to be at war with 1.4 billion people is absurd. Hmm. Um, you know, we have historical examples. We had a, a half-century Cold War with the Soviet Union in which never a shot was fired uh, between the two main antagonists. Uh, so the thought that, you know, we, we suddenly have to be in a shooting war with all of Islam uh, if we acknowledge that there's a significant Islamist campaign against us is, is kind of a silly notion, but it is one that backs people up. The second point, uh, and the not-so-well-meaning people I was referring to, is the other uh, uh, main theme of my book, which is that um, Islamists and leftists uh, have been colluding for decades. In fact, they've been colluding for uh, a lot longer than that. There are a lot of uh, historical examples of it, uh, but the reason that, that they invade our language and don't let us call a spade a spade, so to speak, um, is precisely because it serves their interests. If you, if you deny the fact that Islamist ideology is what's driving the threat against us, then you invite the question whether it mustn't be something else. Uh, and if the something else is American policy, if the something else is Israel or Gitmo or, uh, you know, whatever uh, pretext they're using this week, um, that's a real opening uh, for leftists to essentially attack America's ability to uh, act in our national defense. And that serves their transnational agenda uh, and their utopia that they'd like to impose on us. Mm -hmm. Ron in Indianapolis, let me see if I can get your question in, please, before the break, and I welcome you. Uh, I hear Mr. McCarthy on, on the issue of moderate Muslims, and I guess my, my point that would be that once they do have dominance in the, in, where, in the world, if you will, that they're really in a moderate Muslim. We, will, we as an infidel, I will have no ally other than those believers who believe like myself, I think down underlying the whole thing in that once they have dominance, they will, you will see the moderation disappear. Uh, Janet, I, I guess, you know, just taking a look at somebody like Zudi Jasser, um, in my mind at least, rebuts the caller's point. I, I understand um, uh, where he's coming from, but I do think that you have to separate out uh, the doctrine, which absolutely is not peaceful or moderate, uh, from people that we see every day, many of whom are patriotic Americans. And, in fact, I can say from first-hand experience, um, without their assistance, we wouldn't have been able to prosecute terrorists in the 1990s. 
Mm. Andy, thank you for that. Ron, thank you for being with us as well. Let me take a break. Andy McCarthy is with us. We're discussing his brand new book, The Grand Jihad. Our number is one eight seven seven live 675 one 548 3675 What is the end game here? And how much are we beginning to systematically acquiesce to the goal they're subscribing to? More with Andy right after this. passionate, the most merciful, from Osama to Obama. May peace be on those who follow the light of guidance. If our messages to you could be carried by words, we wouldn't have done that by planes. The message I want to convey to you through the plane of the hero Omar al farouq we affirm the previous message that the heroes of 9-11 conveyed to you and it was repeated frequently. The message is that America will never dream of living in peace unless we live it in Palestine. Uh, interesting how that always works its way into the equation, is it not? Welcome to In the Market. I'm Janet Parshall, your host. Andy McCarthy is with us, former federal prosecutor and the author of The Grand Jihad. It is his newest book. It lays out the agenda of Islamism, his word, I think it's an appropriate one, that explains the desire to have, under a divine dictate, a global Islamic system. I've got a lot of people online, and I'm torn, Andy, but let me ask you before I go back to the phones, the definition of two words. You make an interesting statement early in the book. You say jihad is not trying to convert you, not directly. It is seeking the imposition of Allah's law, which, so the story goes, will lead us to all become Muslims, but not force us to do so. Expand, please. Well, the mission of Sharia, where always and everywhere is to implement, uh, I'm sorry, the mission of jihad is always and everywhere to implement Sharia law. In Islamist ideology, uh, the idea is that once Sharia law is implemented, then, as Saeed could have put it, uh, people's uh, minds and hearts can be opened to uh, the ultimate truth and to Islam, and that's when people will adopt it. So the idea you hear often uh, people in the West say, well, the Koran says there shall be no compunction in religion. Well, uh, that's, that's true only in the sense that um, uh, you, you won't be forced to convert, but the idea is they can forcibly implement Sharia law, and once Sharia law is implemented, everyone will see the good sense of becoming a Muslim. That's how the, the, uh, the idea works. All right, second term, and then I will go to the phones, Andy. What's Dawa? D-A-W-A. Yeah, Dawa is uh, what would be called the missionary work of, uh, of spreading Islam, although, as I point out in the book, it's not really missionary um, in the sense that we understand missionary work in uh, the religions that we're familiar with in the West. You mentioned... Uh, my good friend uh, Bob Spencer's uh, uh, articulation of stealth jihad. Yes. I think uh, that I, I haven't heard anyone put it better than, than Spencer does. I think stealth jihad is a good description of what Dawa is. Uh, it's basically um, jihad without violence. It's uh, the way that uh, Sharia is marched through our institutions, not necessarily without firing a shot because they are slipstreaming behind the atmosphere of, uh, of intimidation that's been created by terrorists, but it's not spreading by, uh, directly by terrorist acts. It's, it's really pushing on every front, economic, social, and legal. 